experience a close reading lesson as if you were in a classroom, but it will also be a lesson that you could go back and teach. So I met with Tamara before we went on break so that I could find out what it is you'll be teaching when you return. So she mentioned, I think you kind of had talked about it as a team, that you'll be doing the Charge of the Light Brigade and the Battle at Balaclava, which I've learned a lot about over the last couple of weeks. Um, but so that's what we'll be focusing on today. So that's really the first purpose, that you would experience a lesson, a close reading lesson, as if you were in the classroom so that it could be replicated. The second purpose is so that you could then, after we leave here today, have some sample lesson plans to take with you of what this would look like if you rolled it out on a more long-term basis. Because a close reading lesson isn't just a single lesson, it's really an experience. And it unfolds over days and lessons, and so that you would leave with a sample of what that looked like. And lastly, that you'd be able to teach one a lesson alongside somebody. So my job is that I'll, I have a proposed schedule in the folder, and if those dates and times aren't set, if it doesn't work for any reason, we can change them. But it's just a proposed schedule so that then I'll come back and we'll plan during a PLC another close reading lesson all together as a team. And then we'd have a 30 minute time slot, I believe it is, um, or a class period to be able to teach a lesson together. Because it's messy. It's a close reading routine. We're teaching junior high kids to do something that is unfamiliar to them with complex text. So we, we just sometimes need to talk it out as with someone alongside us as we do it. So it's like basically when you're out there coaching, we have a lot of coaches in the room, you just stand alongside someone and do it until it gets comfortable, you talk it out, you make mistakes, and then you figure out what works and get into the groove. So that's the ultimate purpose long term of today. So it'll start with this hour and 45 minute segment. So in your yellow folder that you have, there are a couple of things you'll need for today. The uh, purple page packet and then the sheet protector. And we'll be using these for lessons, so these can stay outside the folder. On the right side, I just, and I'll just give you an overview so you can kind of see what it is um, you'll be leaving with. You certainly don't have to follow exactly what is in here. This is not like, go do this. This is just, hey, if you need some, need some resources or some information, here are some things that might be helpful to you. So the first page is just the proposed follow-up. So Friday on January 20th, our PLC would plan a close reading lesson collectively together, and then class periods on two different days. But if it doesn't work, please don't worry about it. This time slot, we can change them. So if yours doesn't work, you can just email me and we'll fix it, okay? So that's just the proposed schedule. Behind that is a, a, a sample of how this close reading experience will unfold. So I have the daily objectives leading up to the final product, so up to your short cycle assessment. Um, and so we're going to be doing the first day of this. So again, it could be replicated if you were to go back to your classroom. And we'll go back to this at the end of the day. I just wanted you to see how this all fits in. Okay. In the packet, I've given you hard copies of the annot annotation resources I have. If you already have an annotation process, don't change it. This is just something because I am not sure what all you have. And you might have something different that we'll use today. But if you already have an existing annotation process, keep it. Okay, but these are from AVID. They're AVID resources that can be used. How to annotate fiction versus nonfiction. It's theoretically the same, slightly different, but we'll go over it. And then it has um, writing in the margins, which is also part of annotation, but it's the actual written portion in the margins. And we only focus on one per day as we train to, maybe one per week or once a month until they learn all of them. So we're not doing all of these today, we would just focus on one box. And then an annotation rubric that kids will self-assess, or you would self-assess yourself on how you annotated, and then that's how we would self-assess the teacher. Again, if you already have an annotation rubric, keep using it, okay? But this is just a resource if you don't. Then um, just a brief a walkthrough of the packet. I have the text we're gonna use today. I removed the original questions that were here that are on your Google Drive. Um, just because today we're going to go beyond those a little bit. So that's why it's removed, so it's there. Then I have the questions for today's lesson, two pages back from that. So if you want to take them back to your classroom and use them, they're here, and they're aligned with the standards. I think Beth has, have you seen this kind of organizer before with the standards on the left? Okay, if you haven't, um, I'll explain it right here. So there are three levels of close reading of a text. What does the text say? which is phase one. And those really align with your first three reading standards. So we can pull questions from there. Okay, and we'll go, we can go over this more in a follow-up session and how to design them. But then the second
second phase is um, how does the text work? And those are your next three levels of standards. Mm -hmm. So the questions come from there. And then your third phase is what does the text actually mean? And those go through your, your higher level standards. Seven, eight, and nine. It is like a ladder though, so sometimes you'll ask questions in phases that go with the standard that's up above or below. It's not specifically set, it just helps to derive questions. Sometimes it's hard to come up with questions. So it allows you, and I'll show you a couple of resources when we meet to plan of how to just pull question stems. So sometimes my brain, I just can't think of one. It's just gone, done. But if I go to a resource, then it starts to activate it. So those are already given for you, and an inspirational task, which in this case would be philosophical chairs. And then I have the next text, but I've removed the annotations, which would be charge of the light brigade. So I'm just going in the order of those plans that I proposed if you wanted to try. And then again, the already written questions, so that you don't have to write them. You could just practice the routine. Okay, I'm just going to keep going. We're almost done. The culminating activity here would be your Ellie, which is comparing and contrasting an event from historical account. And then I have your Ellie resource in there, and the blank page, and then I just have your rubric, so if you just didn't want to have to pull it all off Google Drive, it's all there for you. And then I have two other proposed close reading texts that you can don't have to use by any means, but and it stays on the topic of heroism, of being a hero, but it talks about the Olympic Games from a fictional account and a non-fictional or informational account. So they're from Common Lit, and it's just um, two that you can use if you choose to. If you have something else you want to use, you certainly could, but they tie to the Light Brigade and the fact that they both are about heroes. What makes a hero? And then you would replicate the same process and the same LE task at the end, comparing it. But students would do this more independently before you had the plan. So that's kind of a big picture of resources. I don't mean to overwhelm you. I just want you to see what you're going to leave with, and where we are in this packet would be at the very beginning. So if you were to take this lesson back to your classroom, you could just start at the beginning of it and then keep moving through. And my hope was that by the time you got to creating close reading questions, I would be here to meet with your PLC and we could practice it together. Any questions on what's here and what we're doing here today? All right. Well, then we will go ahead and get started. So because this is a classroom, um, we're going to treat it as such today. So a couple of expectations is that we will be in groups or pairs today. So you're already set up. So I'm going to make sure you have all have a partner today. So you three will be a triad today. Okay. Then it'll be you two. And uh, gentlemen, it will be you two on the end here. Ladies, you two at the back. And then you two <laughs> gentlemen. And then you two gentlemen. All right. So everybody has a partner. Um, this is something Beth went over at a recent training, so um, if you've heard this, if some of your team members that went brought it back, that, and this is for you, for you sports people out there, ESPN, that's what we expect when you are talking to your partner. So you're going to turn your eyes and your shoulders towards your partner. So it's, I taught this this freshman last year, it was painful, right? It's like, you know, it's, but you really have to turn your shoulders and your eyes. You don't have to turn your whole body, but your shoulders and your eyes have to turn when you talk. You need to use part of the question when you talk with your partner. <coughs> so I want you to steal the words from the question I ask. So if I say, what is the author's purpose in this text? What words can you steal to start your sentence? The author's purpose in this text is. Okay, so you have to steal part of the question to start your statement or response. And your response needs to be neat and complete. So today, if you give a response and I go like this, it doesn't mean you're wrong. It just means it needs to be in a complete <clears throat> sentence. So this is one of the most important things we can do for academic conversations or classroom discussions. To make them sound more rigorous and academic is always require a complete sentence. So I have this one theory, and it's a scientific theory, that guides everything I do in instruction. So I want you to think about it for a minute. Here it is. The brain is a pattern-seeking device. It's designed not to have to think. So say it one more time. Our brains are pattern-seeking devices. They're designed not to have to think. Okay. So what that means is, right, if you coach a sport, you know if you're trying to teach your uh, student or athlete a new skill, you have them do it over and over and over and over again, right? Now why do we do that? Because what do we hope happens at the game? They do it automatically. They don't think about it anymore, right? But you have to do it again and again and again and again. 
Same thing, like my husband leaves his socks on the floor. We've been married for 10 years. He cannot seem to get that sock into the hamper, which is like three feet from where it lands on the floor. Why? Because for 30 years, he threw his socks on the floor before I met him, right? So his pattern is set. He puts the sock on the floor. I'm undoing 30 years of a pattern-seeking device, so I've got 20 more years of marriage to get it into the hamper. So I say this because when we're talking with our students, we have to be on this. So it's going to be like complete sentence boot camp. And starting back school tomorrow is the perfect time to do it. Say so we're getting you ready for your eighth grade year. Every, 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 at all times, every sentence or statement needs to be in a complete sentence or a complete thought. Okay, and it will be painful because they'll forget. So just have some kind of a silent signal, like I will say if you see me do this. Does that mean you're wrong? Just means I'm going to give you a little more time to put it into a complete sentence. Okay? So we're going to practice these things today. The ESPN, eyes and shoulders to your partner. Steal part of the question to answer and use a complete sentence when you talk with your partner. You've already been to some trainings about close reading, is that right? For the most part, or had some in-service information. So I want you to turn to your partner, eyes and shoulders, and tell them, what is close reading? What is it? routine in which students are guided in their understanding of complex text. And we, I think when you go with Ginny today, you'll be looking at what makes a text complex and how to pick it. But the overall definition of a complex text is one that doesn't give up its meaning easily or quickly. So not every text deserves a close reading. If you're reading for pleasure, you don't do a close reading. If it's a, like a textbook selection, you wouldn't close read it because maybe it's explaining things pretty simply so that we can understand them, let's say. So maybe that's not something I would close read. We have to select those texts carefully. And certainly the ones in your unit are very complex. So the Battle of Balaclava and the Charge of the Light Brigade are certainly complex for seventh graders. So those are good ones to use to start. Close reading is for short, complex passages. So one thing I wrestled with in the classroom was, okay, so how I don't, I don't always have a super short, complex text. Well, what you'll see today, when we go back, we're only going to go back and reread one to three paragraphs closely. We're going to read the whole thing one time through, but then we're going to go back and close read just paragraph two. Just that, that small section. That deserves a close reading. There's hidden meaning in there between the lines that we need to go back to. And then we'll go back, <clears throat> excuse me, and close read paragraphs five and six, because there is hidden meaning in there that if we don't go back to again and again, we'll miss. Repeating readings with varied purposes. We all know middle school kids get, they don't want to be made just to read, just to read it again and again and again. So the worst thing we can do is just say, we have to read this so many times. There's no number. Some people say three. That's just, that's made up. There is no specific number of readings you have to do. 
It's just however many times you have to read it to understand it, and you need to have something different each time, otherwise kids will tune out and check out, right? We want to keep them engaged and want to go in and find that information each time. Annotations, and again, today we're just using the avid resources, marking the text and writing in the margins, but there are a lot of different annotation sources you could use. But these two are equally important, collaborative conversations and text-dependent questions. So that's how these lessons were designed that you have in your packet, and certainly at the end of today when we finish, we'll just have a discussion about them. Questions, answers, discussions, I don't have all the answers, but we'll have a discussion together, and if there's any information we need when we leave, that'll be my job to bring that back to you next time. Okay? Are you ready to get started? All right. Um, I have in the middle just the close reading routine that, I, that we will be following today, okay? Because it is a routine. So like I said, with every text, what the meat of it will be different, but this is the routine we will follow. We'll activate build uh, prior knowledge before we read, but only a small amount because close reads are supposed to be, have not a lot of background building because they're supposed to want to persevere and seek that information. But because these texts are so complex, I will give, we'll give a brief background knowledge today. We'll have an essential question, and this will be our philosophical chairs essential question at the end. So the goal is that they have a bigger question to answer, not just doing this task, but why are we doing these, this routine for an ultimate goal of answering this question. We will number the paragraphs, and then we'll front load and clarify essential vocabulary. Today, I'm going to do it somewhat briefly, just kind of more in context, only the essential words, that the meaning of the words can't be found in the text. But because I want to get through the whole thing in our hour and 45 minutes today, certainly I know you have a lot of vocabulary strategies, and I know we might go over some of that with you in your other session. So take that point portion and know you could um, amp it up or change it as you, with your knowledge and experience that you have. But then we'll do the phase one reading today, where we'll mark the text, and I'll walk you through this, and we have a couple of different options which we'll review when we get to that point. Phase two reading and phase three reading we'll do today. What we do today, we have an hour and 45 minutes, so it's not going to take one class period. So you're gonna decide how many class periods you think it will take, okay? So that's why I want you to know too, this isn't like a one, it's not a one shot deal, we sit down in one class period and read it. If you wanna do it that way, you just have to design your close reading lesson. So I'll keep coming back to this, but just so you know, it's taped there to the middle if you want to keep referencing it as we go. All right, so we are going to get started today, so make sure you can put your folder to the side. You just need these two things in front of you today. So if you would, take your purple sheet and fold it back. And just put your name at the top so we know whose it is. for today. So here is what we are learning to do today. We will be able by the end of this se session to annotate an informational text to show that we comprehend or understand it. And we will cite textual evidence as we answer text-dependent questions or questions that depend on the text. Okay, I'm going to give you 30 seconds. Turn to your partner and tell them what are your two objectives for today. And I can see the sentence. Ready? Go. Tell your partner. <laughs> All right, excellent. Come back together. Five, four, three, two, and one. And uh, number fifteen. What will we be doing today? What are we learning today? Fifteen. Anybody? Oh, just kidding. We don't have 15 people. Let's go 14. Oh, that's a... Okay. Well, cool. uh, what are we learning today? Um, that we're going to annotate informational text and cite evidence. Excellent. And we need to know why are we doing this today. So when you look at that picture, tell you, have you seen this one before? Oh, no, I have. Darn. All right. Oh, tell your partner what you see. What did you see? Tell your partner. Okay. Well, I have to tell your partner what you saw. I saw like a half of the clouds. Like, you can see a cat. Okay, if you've seen it, you can't play. You're out. Okay? Did you purposely shoot it up and then Yeah, and then I'll back. All right. So what is it that you see? I'll take a volunteer. What did you see in your initial glance? What did you see? Um, it looked like an island. It looked like a face. Okay. So, and then we were also discussing in the 
the background, maybe it was a gorilla. Okay, so maybe we saw a face in the eyes in the middle, maybe a gorilla in the background. All right, this time, I'm going to let you look at it again for a little bit longer. You can talk with a partner about what you see. Ready? Yeah. 
but if they can take out Sevastopol, then the Russians have no presence in the Black Sea whatsoever. And remember, they're fighting for control of this Ottoman Empire, right? So they want to control the way people are getting in and out. So that is if both of those are great inferences. It didn't tell us that in the text, but we can infer that just based on the information that we have. So the text we're reading today comes from a time when this was told. So one thing that's unique about this war at Balaklava is it was the first war to employ the news media. It was the first in history to employ the news media, and which brought home stories of the war within days of the actual event, and it was the first time photography was used to capture images of the war. So it's a war we don't hear a lot about, but what we're going to be reading is a significant event in history, and also because it was the first time war was captured. So today as we get go into our text, we're going to have this essential question. So I'm going to ask you to please write this essential question at the top of your paper. We're going to read about British soldiers of the Light Brigade. And our question today is, did the British soldiers of the Light Brigade die with honor? This is our essential question. Did the British soldiers of the Light Brigade die with honor? So everybody has that essential question up at the top. All right, so we are going to get started now. The first thing we're going to do before we read is we are going to look at some key vocabulary that we can't figure out the meaning of in the text. So we're going to be, I'm going to tell you what some of those words mean before we read. But the first thing we need to do is number the paragraphs. So I'm going to say the first two words of a paragraph, and you're just going to circle it. The numbers are already there, okay? So we're going to practice this because this is how I would do it if they weren't numbered. They would have to, okay? So they swept is one. So everyone say one. One. They advanced. Two. 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 Circle two. The first. Three. Through the four. wounded men. Five. Then that continues paragraph five. The Russian Six. at 25. Seven. Okay. So again, if these weren't numbered, that's how I do it so we can quickly number them. The reason I do that is because sometimes there's like a one-liner and they're not, or there are a bunch of individual lines and they're not quite sure how to group them. But because our objective is that they cite text evidence, they have to be able to go back and refer to a paragraph. So they have to be numbered before we start. Okay? All right. So the first thing we're going to do then is look at, in each paragraph, what are some essential vocabulary words that we have to know in order to understand the text. Okay? So I'm going to give you a couple, and we're going to mark them right here in the text. So in paragraph one, Everyone box this word discretion. This is an essential vocabulary word. If you have discretion in something, you have the ability to decide it. Okay? So if you have discretion, we're just going to mark the definition there. You have the ability to decide what is done. So I'll take a volunteer. What's something that you have discretion of in your household? What's your, what do you have discretion what we eat for dinner? Okay, excellent. Nice job. Put me in a sentence. What do you have discretion of in your household or, or over? I have the ability to decide. <laughs> nice job. So it is what you get what you get, right? And you don't throw a fit. That's right. All right, so that you have the ability to decide. So let's look in paragraph two. I want you to box the word beheld. Beheld means to see in the past tense. So if you behold something, you see it. That's one definition. So this would be the past tense would be they saw it. And another word in this paragraph that we need to know that we don't use very often is steeds. Okay. Has anybody heard this term before? A steed. What is a steed? A horse. It's a horse. And it's a strong, fast horse. Okay. So if you haven't, if you don't know a lot about horses, these are strong, fast horses. And in paragraph three, one of the words that we need to know 
is this word oblique? Mm. Oblique fire. And as we read it today, we want to know what it means. It means indirect. <laughs> like it's, you can't see something coming if it's oblique. It's kind of coming from the sides. You don't see it coming directly at you. Um, are these the kinds of words that you can make a word wall out of? Yes. Yeah. So that's what, today we're just doing kind of a quick part of the vocabulary, but absolutely, that's what I want you to think about when you, especially when you go to Ginny or when you meet with your team. You might have things you want to do, or we just don't have a lot of time together today, but if you wanted to do, like there's the um, prayer model where you have them put the word in the middle and the definition, examples, non-examples, synonyms, you want to do that for every word. But you might select to do things like that with your words. You would put these maybe words on the grammar wall. You would, so we would do different things with them as we go. But um, today we're just kind of doing a summary of them. And in fact, I will thank you for asking that because I do want, I did want to make that point clear that um, this is really, we're just kind of doing an overview of it today. And I'll show you what I have. I can't flip back and forth because of um, her system there. But I'll just show you. So then I have visuals for some of them too. So I'll kind of show you briefly from here today. But not for every word. Notice some of these, and this is what Tim Shanahan, who also focuses on close reading, says. Sometimes you just give kids the definition before they start to read. Because we can't spend, we all know we have 50, what, 52 minutes, 53 minutes in a class period. I can't teach every word with the Frere model and do activities with every word. So I might then, with the ones that I'm boxing and giving you the definition of, I might spend maybe 10 minutes on two or three of those high leverage words that are really important and then get all the words on the word wall would be a great idea. Okay, but, and then visuals maybe for some of them as we go. All right, so the last word in this paragraph that we need to know what it is is musketry. Has anybody heard of a musket before? Yeah, what is a musket? Will you tell us in a complete sentence? A musket uh, was a older style gun. I used to have a model musket myself. Yeah, they almost look like rifles, right? They were the really long guns. And I, I made the conscious decision not to pull pictures of a gun. <laughs> For this, but you could um, certainly if you thought the group could handle it. But um, just the secondary, sometimes I try to leave some of those things out. But it's like a rifle; it's a long gun. But so musket tree, when we see that suffix, is the fire from a long gun, similar to a rifle. So we're just going to write that in. It's the firing or the fire from a long gun, similar to a rifle. All right, in paragraph four, if you'll see here on this line, it says Russian <laughs> infantry. Infantry is a term we still use today when we're talking about the military. And infantry, and I'll show you here in my picture if you can see it, picture can here, is soldiers who fought on foot. And we still have soldiers today who fight on foot. So those are the infantry units. They're soldiers who fight on feet, or in this case, past tense, soldiers who fought. Another word that we don't use or hear very often is this word chaff, but it's important to the meaning of the text. So the chaff is the outer seed of grain that they usually, as they're taking the seed out, the grain, the chaff is the outer casings that they just kind of drop off. So we'll put the outer casing. from the Battle of Balaclava, and you can see the sides, right? So for these soldiers in the middle, their flanks would be on the side, similar to the flank stake definition. So we'll put the sides of an army in battle. All right, so let's turn our paper over. And I'm just going to give you a couple more definitions before you do your first reading. So in paragraph five, the word regiments. So we're going to box the word regiments, which is right here. 
and we still use this term today when we're talking about the war military, and this is a large group of soldiers. So it's plural, so this means lar uh, large groups of soldiers. Then we have credence. Does anyone know what the word credence means? <laughs> credence is to accept something as true. So if something has credence, like we can actually accept that it's true. Some things have no credence, like there's no way that could be true. But credence means acceptance as truth. We accept it to be true. And the last word we're going to box today is in paragraph six, and it is the word miscreants. Miscreants is an important word. Did you have a lot of them in your class? <laughs> okay, what is a miscreant? Yeah, so if you're talking about your best case, but people, the definition according to the dictionary is bad people who cause harm okay. <laughs> or trouble. you're going to come to some other words that you don't know as you read. And you're going to do just as we did here, you're going to box the words that you don't know. But if you box them, and I have not given you a definition, that means you should be able to use a context clue, a clue around the word, to be able to figure out what that word means. So I've only given you today the ones that you can't use context clues for in order to figure out what they mean. Okay. So let me pause right here for a minute. There are a lot of them. This is a dense text. There's a lot of vocabulary that's specific to the time, right, and specific to the scenario. So that's what I did is I just went through and I boxed all the words that I thought students would have trouble with, and then I decided which ones could they figure out the meaning of using context clues and which ones couldn't they. And those are the ones that I spend the time on just on this part. And again, you could take this list and then do some of what you've mentioned about going deeper with them when you had the time to do it with your resources or ideas that you have. Okay? All right, so now what we're going to do is we are going, we've numbered our paragraphs and we know our vocabulary that is essential. So you can see we just finished the prior to reading routine, okay? Now we're going to get into the phase one, the first phase of the reading. So today as we read, you are going to mark the text. So I want you to look at your, you're going to put this right next to your text. And this is nonfiction. So we've already done step one. Step number two is all you're going to do in our first read today. As we read the first time, you're going to circle any key terms. And these are different ideas of how to pick a key term. How do you know it's a key term? And it's not just a term. But today I'm going to tell you that we're just going to focus on people and places. So I just want you to circle key people and places in the text as we read. Any questions on that? That's all you're doing today as we read. Okay, keep people and keep places, and I'm going to read the first part aloud to you, and you will finish reading on your own, okay? But I'm going to read out loud so you can practice just getting started and circling those key people and places. So that first paragraph that we did not number is just an introduction to the text. It says, quote, they swept proudly past, glittering in the morning sun, end quote. William Howard Russell was a correspondent, or a reporter, for the London Illustrated News and was present at the battle. It was his description that prompted Tennyson's poem, which we're going to be reading later this week, next week. We join Russell's account as the Light Brigade begins its charge. And a brigade is just a group of soldiers. That's what brigade means. So we're going to get started reading paragraph number one. They swept proudly past, glittering in the morning sun in all the pride and splendor of war. We could hardly believe the evidence of our senses. Surely that handful of men were not going to charge an army in position. Alas, it was but too true. Their desperate valor knew no bounds, and far indeed was it removed from its so-called better part, discretion. They advanced in two lines quickening their pace as they closed towards the enemy. 
A more fearful spectacle was never witnessed than by those who, without the power to aid, beheld their heroic countrymen rushing to the arms of death. At the distance of 1,200 yards, the whole line of the enemy belched forth from 30 iron mouths a flood of smoke and flame through which hissed the deadly balls. Their flight was marked by instant gaps in our ranks, by dead men and horses, by steeds flying wounded or riderless across the plain. The first line was broken. It was joined by the second. They never halted or checked their speed an instant. With diminished ranks, thinned by those 30 guns, which the Russians had laid with the most deadly accuracy, with a halo of flashing steel above their heads, and with a cheer, which was many a noble fellow's death cry, they flew into the smoke of the batteries. But here, they were lost from view. The plain was strewed with their bodies and with the carcasses of horses. They were exposed to an oblique fire from the batteries on the hills on both sides, as well as to a direct fire of musketry. I'm going to finish reading to yourself paragraphs 4, 5, 6, and 7, and circle two terms. You are finished reading. Turn and talk with your partner. Tell them who are the key people or places you circled. And if you've lost any words, you can talk with your partner about the meaning of those words using your context clues. Okay? We'll give you two minutes. <laughs>
the Russians were all around them. And what evidence leads you to that conclusion? You're going to underline any evidence that tells us, were the British soldiers aware that the Russians were all around them? Are we still in paragraph two? Paragraph two. So you're going to go back and look at just at paragraph two. Okay. Talk, underline, and summarize. headlong into the arms of death so we can infer that they did not know that the Russian they were rushing towards the Russians themselves. Okay. All right. But there's, there's no evidence for it they were <laughs> Well and that's true we're just making an inference. You're right. So we from the historical account it's, it seems that they were unaware at this point, at right? This point, as they enter. We're only in paragraph two. So we're gonna get to paragraphs five and six here in just a moment, but at the beginning of the event, the text, in paragraph two, as the event begins, it appears, based on the text evidence, that they were not aware that they were rushing into the arms of death. It also says that the more fearful spectacle was never witnessed by those who, without the power to aid, held their remote countrymen. So basically, it's telling you that the people who were watching the British marched to their death, they were like watching in horror, like, oh my gosh, I can't believe they could this. see. They could happening. see it, but the British couldn't. Nice, so that's good text evidence, a good discussion between the two of you based on evidence, okay? And that's what we want to see in this section. This is only phase one, meaning I'm just trying to sense whether or not we even understand the text before we get into phase two and phase three. So you can see this text, because it is so dense and rich, requires a lot of discussion and keep continuing to go back. We're only in par rereading paragraph two at this point, right? Okay? So according to this historical account, what caused the result described in paragraph seven? So we're going to flip now, okay? In paragraph seven, it says, at 25 to 12, not a British soldier, except the dead and dying, 
was left in front of in front of these bloody Muscovite guns. So this time we're going to go outside of paragraph two. You can talk with your partner. What caused this event? If it is true that they went unaware towards the Russians, what caused this to happen according to this historical account? So the reason I'm asking this here is before we do any more close reading, I want to see if you understand the overall text. This is just phase one. I'm just trying to get a sense if you can comprehend the text before we dig even deeper. Okay, so this is an essential question for that. So turn and talk with your partners. What caused the, the <coughs> result in describing paragraph seven? Turn and talk with your partner. Thank you. 
our discussions or annotations, students did not understand the meaning, I'm sorry, what the text actually said, what it actually said, just looking at the evidence, then we would want to spend more time having a conversation about the text. So we don't just automatically move to the second read, the second phase. We want to make sure students understand what the text actually says before we move on to how the text works. Because it's a higher level of cognitive thinking or abilities that we want to make sure they're ready for. Okay? So you can see from this, you might need to spend some time and prepare to spend some time really understanding what does the text say. Any questions, concerns on this first phase? We did the pre-reading so far and prior to reading and phase one. I want you just to talk with your partner, see if you have any questions or concerns, and then I will answer any that you want to ask afterwards. So I'll give you about two minutes. Just kind of process pre-reading and phase one with your partner first. Okay? as they talk with their partner the essential ideas, 
and they would want to continue our focus writing in the margin, which today would be summarizing or putting in our own words what happened, because this is nonfiction. And then these are the types of questions. So I'm just going to walk through these today. So we did pretty much the full phase one that you would do with your class when you return. Phase two, again, now I just have, this is how does the text work? And I'm just, I've just listed questions specific to paragraph number two, okay? So what type of figurative language is arms of death? And what does this phrase mean in this selection? So that would be an example of how does a text work. What type of figurative language is from 30 Iron Mouse? That phrase, a flood of smoke and flame through which hiss the deadly bolt. And what is the effect of the use of that figurative language, whatever it is they determine it is, on the reader? And in the last line of paragraph two, the author uses repetition, or if you've taught parallel structure or parallelism, he says by, by, by. So if you go to the last line of paragraph two, it says, at the distance of 1,200 yards, the whole line of the, I'm sorry, last sentence, their flight was marked by instant gaps in our ranks, by dead men and horses, by steeds flying wounded or riderless across the plain. So where do we see repetition or parallel structure? By, by, by. And what is the effect of that on the reader? When you hear that again and again and again, what is the effect as we read? So these are examples of structural questions. How does the text work? And what I provided you, if you want to go deeper with that, the not just do paragraph two, you think your group can handle a closer read of multiple sections, I've also given you questions for paragraphs, sorry, five and six. So those would be the three heaviest in terms of uh, knowledge and information paragraphs in this text. So if they could go back and dig information out of those, then they will get the hidden meaning that's kind of the in-between the lines meaning that lies there. Okay, so any questions <coughs> on the second read? And then again, sorry, we don't have time to do all the things I want to give you time to process the entire packet we have here. But secondly, yes? So with like text structure, it's okay to jump from one paragraph to the next, like you said, like if you say paragraph two, what are your language to paragraph five, is it in chronological order and why? You could, and that's the thing, it's just that you, um, if you can you can do that, certainly, but yes. That's what I want you to remember, that this is an instructional routine, so there aren't, there isn't an exact formula to doing it, okay? So yes, if I say I know my focus, for phase two, how the text works, that there's a lot of figurative language within that text. We've already read the whole text once, so then I can have them go back. I would just keep it in order of the text. Don't jump like one to seven to two to four, but try to keep it in order so that they can see how the use of figurative language was used throughout the text from beginning to end. That's a good question. Any other questions or comments about the second? One thing and that when we meet to plan during your PLC is for this first time, I've, if you choose to go with this PowerPoint and the questions here, I've kept the student tasks the same. Meaning that each time in read one, what does the text say? They're underlining and summarizing. Then when I put the second phase questions, I have the task for them to talk with their partner, underline and summarize again. The reason I kept it the same this first time, if you go back and do this, is so that they can get used to this process of annotating meaningful information. But when we meet to plan, the goal is that when we have them do their second phase of reading, we do something different. Like we might do inner circle, outer circle partner discussions. We, we change it up, but right now we want to remember the brain is a pattern seeking device designed not to have to think. So just get them used to this process of, like I talk, we underline, we put it in our own words. We talk, we underline, we put it in our own <coughs> words, and then we'll be able to branch out and vary the way, the things that they do or tasks they do as they dig deeper in phase two. Okay. The third read now is looking at what does the text actually mean? And remember from the planning sheet, this aligns to your standards seven, eight, and nine of your reading standards. So again, you'll see I kept it the same. If you use this PowerPoint, they're doing the same task as they work with their partner. But now we're looking at the overall text. So this one doesn't hone in on just one paragraph anymore, even though they'll need to possibly go back and reread to find the answers. It might not be honed in. 
But what did the author hope to accomplish when he wrote this text? Did he accomplish it? What was the overall effect of the text on the reader? How was our mood as we read this? And from the author's perspective, how was this event perceived? As a tragic event or a heroic event? And to vary this one, we would do a written conversation. Okay, so this one would be a little bit different but we want them to now write like they've had the discussion. So this time, we would give them an opportunity, so we're gonna try it out right now. You have, we give them an opportunity to talk with their main partner first. Then they have to find a different partner. So they might have the partner next to them to discuss the question and the partner behind or in front of them to do the written conversation. Because we're adults and we're tight and let you just do it with the person next to you right now. But take the back side of your purple paper, if you haven't already written on it. <coughs> if you have, you can use any other piece of paper. But we are going to answer number three, and just so you can see what the written conversation looks like. Okay, you're going to answer number three. So everybody is going to use this frame to start. From the author's perspective, how was this event perceived? As a tragic event or a heroic event? So you're going to start like this. I think that, and you have to steal words from the question. This event was perceived as blank, and then because, and then you finish it, okay? So do that now. I'll give you two minutes. I tell students this is like texting, but academic. <laughs> so instead of texting formal or uh, informal language, you're going to write academically, and then we're going to swap. about 30 seconds, finish your statement, and be ready to swap with the partner. Okay, at this time, finish your sentence. You're going to trade your paper with a partner. This time you can do the partner next to you. Again, with our students in more room, we would have them switch. You are going to respond. So you're going to use the purple frame. You are going to either agree or disagree with that statement made by your partner, but you have to tell why. And you cannot use the same words that your partner used. So you have to try to agree or disagree with different reasons and language, okay? So switch with the partner. I'll give you two minutes to respond using the purple frame. This is the last one we'll do, by the way. So just switch and respond so that you have a sample of what it looks like as I'm trying to get you to go back. Even if they said something that you didn't believe, can you still agree with it? Like, so... Like, if they make a good point. Yeah, so then you can say, I agree with the fact that blank. However, I disagree with the fact that it was seen as a heroic event. Yes. Yeah. have not your partner, not your own paper, but your partner's going to be writing. You're not discussing at this point. It's just a written conversation because at this point you would have already talked. Or just do it. I want you to have a sample when you leave today.
then you actually write your response. will be a philosophical cheers about whether or not it was heroic. So this is an opportunity to start thinking about was it tragic or heroic and get some other ideas. So you would have had a talk with a partner, you would have traded and had a written conversation with another partner, and then the next day we would come back and you would get to decide. So if in your philosophical chairs you're going to have a yes, I, it's tragic, um, or no, it's tragic or heroic, then, but you might have a in the middle between, then you could allow it. But if you're not going to have that, just know kind of what your ultimate goal is, is that essentially you're gonna to have to have this oral conversation. So you could say, which way would you lean? So you might write your partner a question. Like, which way would you? Because she had good reasons for each side. Right. You know. So that's, yes, yeah, she would be ready to go on either side of the philosophical chairs when we get to that point. Okay. Okay. Another thing, so a written conversation would be one way to culminate the close reading lesson with some form of writing. So that means that we now are going to take the way we've been talking in class and we're going to do it in a written form. And it has to be academic. So you can collect these and give them a four, three, two, or one. Um, and I'll try to include in that a, kind of a quick write um, overall rubric if you'd like to use that. Um, also, you could just do a general question, so if, if you don't have the time for a written conversation to close your lesson, you always want to close it with some form of writing where they have a chance to reflect. So you might just ask the question, did the British soldiers of the Light Brigade die with honor? And students have an opportunity to quick write. Just write as much as you can, as fast as you can, as well as you can. So you're they're really trying to get their thoughts on paper before you close the lesson for that day. So that is another option that's in the PowerPoint, some way to take them to writing before the lesson concludes. Okay? And then this is going to lead us into the packet as we wrap up here. Um, so if you would just go back to that front page, and I'm just going to walk through the objectives here with you. Okay? Again, this is not ma like mandated or you don't have to do this. This is just a recommendation of how it would lay out leading up to your short cycle assessment. Right? So we're teaching these things up to the point. Our primary standard for this unit in your short cycle assessments to would focus on comparing a historical account and a fictional account of the same event. So the informational or fiction and nonfiction of the same event. So that's really what we're focusing on. So you'll see the first objective there says we'll be able to uh, close read informational text, annotate the text, and answer those text dependent questions using the Battle of Balaclava. That is what we did together today. Now you see it has one box here. Does that mean it'll take only one lesson? No. So you're going to decide, okay, that's just the one objective, but how many lessons this would take. <coughs> the other thing is, you don't want to spend one month on the Battle of Bola We could. We could spend an entire month on this step. But 
So we just have to just make teacher decisions about which is the highest impact paragraph for us to close reading. So we want to then kind of hone in. And I think that will be some of the discussion you have in your next session. You'll see the next objective says we'll be able to discuss different sides of a controversy using appropriate language to demonstrate higher level thinking and argument. That would be philosophical chairs. And I will send um, a resource when I email you all of this electronically. I'll send you a philosophical chairs kind of a resource packet if you haven't done it before. But I also have it here in the PowerPoint. It tells them what they're doing, why they're doing it, and how they'll know they've learned it. So there's something at the end they have to evaluate how it went. Um, it starts with it, but then it, it just shows you how to set it up as a guideline. But I'll send you another resource packet. It's an avid strategy, but it's also just a best practice. <laughs> okay. And then it has sentence frames to go with it. So during their philosophical chairs conversation or dialogue, these are frames they should be using when they speak. Okay, I'm going to go to the third box. Everyone with me so far? The next one would be to collaboratively close read a poem, annotate the text, and answer text-dependent questions. So this would be with the charge of the light brigade. So we would keep, remember we're trying to keep our procedures the same for this segment. So we would do our same annotation procedures because now they should be more skilled at it. And we're going to give them the opportunity to practice one last text that went this way. This one is fiction. So it'll be a little bit different in how we mark. Oh, I have it over here how we mark the text. They're just looking for different things, but the steps, if you choose to use these annotation steps, are the same. Just to reiterate, if you have your own annotation procedure, you do not need to use these. These are just, if you don't have anything in place, you want to have something systematic in place. Ideally, it would be the same for all. Okay. Then, the next objective would be to collaboratively compare and contrast the fictional account and the historical account. So that means that we would be using the LE Graphic Organizer together at this point. This would be a collaborative effort. And then in the LE it says to create a Google Slides presentation and to present that presentation. So if you choose to do that portion of the LE that's in here, would be your presentation standard speaking in like me. If you go down to the next box, that's orally presenting those slides. The next box would be we'll be able to independently read an informational text. So now what happens is we've done all of the Battle of Balaclava and Charge of the Light Brigade collaboratively or guided. But we need, so sometimes it's hard with those LEs. We see them and we just do LE1 and we just do LE3. But the way they're designed is really to be a form of assessing the students. So we did this whole thing together. That means we can't really tell what they're able to do. So that's why I pulled for you another informational text on heroism in the Olympics. And then the next day says we will independently read a fictional text, and that is the myth, um, the, I think it's a Greek myth on the Olympics, and what makes a hero according to the myth. So then students would be doing that independently. And I chose to put Charge of the Light Brigade and Battle of Balaclava guided. Why? Because it's so difficult. I mean, it's extremely complex. These other two texts are still complex, but not nearly to the level of the, the help from the teacher talk discussion that the battle of all the topics is. Okay? And then they would be able to independently compare and contrast the Olympics informational text with the uh, myth, Greek myth. And then if you had a formal short cycle or informal short cycle assessment, and then I have a reteaching day. So it's looking at, just to get through this, this uh, master standards up at the top, you're looking at about three weeks, and that's depending on how much time you spend on the text. But that's getting you through your mastery standards and um, one LE, and that one is your heaviest LE in the unit. Okay? Any questions, thoughts, concerns, comments on this packet? Yes? I don't know about the packet, but as far as the question, what do we expect of them? Do they need a copy of evidence, or is it just write everything down as you can? Okay, so good question. So that's why I'll send a couple of sample quick write rubrics just means that they have the opportunity to self-assess what it is. So you can look at a lot of different, so a quick write by definition is write as much as you can, as fast as you can, as well as you can. It's basically a stream of consciousness in writing. But we, when we're looking, though, there are other forms of it, too. So, go ahead, you want to add something? It goes back to what I was saying this morning, what we need to train our kids in. So, in doing those quick writes, they need to be able to summarize their thoughts. So, we're really looking at training them to, um, to attack those constructed responses by having them write in their quick writes a main idea or a topic sentence and then support their pieces beyond that. 
Yes, absolutely. And one of them I used to use in my classroom is eight. So answer, um, provide evidence or an explanation, uh, provide evidence and then explain. Yeah. So even if it's just that's so training them. So it's write as much as you can, as fast as you can, as well as you can. But again, training them to do that with a specific structure. So I'll send a couple of sample rubrics that just allow kids to say, okay, I did my quick write. Would I give myself a four, three, two, or one? Did I summarize today's lesson in its entirety? Did I provide some evidence or specific information from the lesson today? And did I explain it or from the, the text itself? So, okay. So when we meet to plan at our PLC, this will be a time to, because I've given you the first two texts with the questions already written, so Beth and I put them together. together. <laughs> um, so we have her input on there too. She is a master of the standards, so we looked at what types of questions aligned with the standards leading up to the phases. Um, but also when we meet, then that'll be up to you for us to form questions together. And so I can show you when you get stuck, where's a resource to get you started? And we can answer any questions that in the classroom, um, if they become a challenge, we can answer at that time too. And then again, if the proposed coaching session, um, and when I say coaching, just co-teaching, we're just doing it together. Um, so that if this period does not work for you on this day, just email me and we can reschedule it. Um, but if possible, the goal, which I'm, I try to get everybody in, so this is all pretty, um, like it goes right after each other, so you're not having big gaps in time so that we all plan one together, we all teach it pretty close together, so you can all talk about it afterwards. Hopefully not about me, but about the class. Okay? All right, I appreciate your time this morning. I think we have a break now, right, until 10 o'clock. And it was great. Wonderful. Thank you. I'll email all of you today. Thank you, Heidi.